May we now request Sri Tathagato Roy, His Excellency, the Governor of Meghalaya, for his address. Present on the dais, <laughs> Dr. H. P. Kanodia, the moving spirit behind this confluence, Sri C. L. Gulati, Secretary of the Sant Nirankari Mission, Srimati Carolina Goswami, founder and editor, India in Details, New Delhi, Srimati Champadevi Kanodia, Brahm Kumari's sister Padma and sister Ashmita, Srimati Ranjini Manian, founder and CEO of Global Adjustments, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely sorry to stand on this podium between you and lunch. So therefore, I shall try to make myself as short as possible, but I, since I don't have a prepared speech, I can't tell beforehand how long I'll take. But I promise to make it short. <clears throat> but in the beginning, I must enter a few caveats. In this meeting on spiritual confluence, we'll have to rubbish certain thoughts that were poured into our ears in this left-wing city. Now, I am, I would be sorry to hurt anybody's feelings because of that, or to be unkind to people, past leaders, philosophers, pseudo-philosophers, who have been revered in this city, but I am known as a right-wing person in a left-wing city, also one who is no stranger to controversy, and one who is occasionally fond of dropping bricks. So with that caveat, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> let me make a few submissions. These are just random thoughts that I have marshaled in preparation of this confluence. Dr. Kanoria has had conceived this confluence quite some time back and he holds it every year. And the fact, that very fact that he spends so much time and money after it shows his seriousness of purpose and the depth to which he has got it, gone into in organizing this. I can't hold a candle to this, and therefore all I could do is to merely share my thoughts that I have on this subject. I had begun by entering a caveat that in this left-wing city, I might ruffle a few feathers. Now, haven't we heard in this city that religion is the opiate of the masses? Some philosopher said it nearly two centuries back. Now, do we feel that it is the opiate? Do we feel that religion has gone out of use? Do we feel that man no longer needs religion? We know perfectly well that we do not feel any such thing. As a matter of fact, we feel quite the opposite, and we have seen that the hold of religion on people has been farmer, has grown farmer. It has not lessened to any extent. So religion is important, and here and now, I am rubbishing that concept that religion is the opiate of the people. We have also, thank you, we have also heard from our very first Prime Minister of this country that in his magnum opus, The Discovery of India, that our lives are littered with the dead wood of the past and we have to, India has to move from religion to science. Now, this is a thing that I have pondered over a lot and I tried to think 
what was the background with which in which Jawaharlal Nehru wrote these lines. He was a product of Harrow and Cambridge. Thereafter, he immersed himself in the freedom struggle, trying to free the country of British yoke. And in the process, he gained valuable knowledge in human nature, in the nature of religion, in the nature of science, or so I would presume. But if you compare this person with another one whom I need not name, you will immediately understand who it is, <laughs> who had by just donning a saffron cloth went all over India on foot, on foot, without a penny in his pocket. In fact, he had no pocket, so no place to put his penny. And by wandering all over India, living only on arms which were given by the people who he approached or whom he attracted, for seven years he had gained the knowledge of India. Not from a rostrum, not from a podium, but by moving all over India on foot, taking the dust of India all over his body. Whose knowledge is more in depth? Whose knowledge would you consider if the two are juxtaposed? Whom would you consider to have more applicable, more depth of knowledge? I would vote that the second person. And perhaps many of you have understood who he is. He is the person who was enacted a little while back by a young man here. His name is Swami Vivekananda. <clears throat> we know Swami Vivekananda, who was a disciple of Paramahansa Ramakrishna. He had lived through terrible privation, both before taking sannyas and after taking sannyas. Before taking sannyas, his father was a solicitor and a moneyed man. But after he died, he found out that he had nothing, literally nothing, so much so that often there was nothing to eat at home. And he used to tell his mother that he is invited to such and such place and then therefore he wouldn't have dinner or he wouldn't have lunch. Actually, it wasn't anything of the sort. He had no invitations. He simply didn't want to tax the little rice that was in the house. Then, in the process, he went and met Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna recognized him, although he had never seen him before, he recognized him that there was divine power in this man. And he went and embraced that man and where, asked him, where were you all this time? And Swami Vivekananda, at that time he was a mere Narendra Dutta. He it sent shivers down his spine and he felt that he was entering a new life. And thus began a chapter in the history of India which would not be equaled in the future, or so I believe. So therefore, Swami Vivekananda thereafter lived with Sri Ramakrishna. And after Sri Ramakrishna's departure from this mortal world, he and his co-disciples, that is his other disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, they were once again thrown into penury. So much so that they lived in a rundown house and from that house, because they had only one dhoti among themselves, they used to, only one person used to wear that dhoti, the rest of the people used to live in loin clothes. And the person who wore the dhoti, he used to go out and beg for money for their daily ration. This is the way he spent. Thereafter, he had this inspiration to go all over India on foot and absorb India in his veins and find out what India consists of, what drives India. In the process of doing this, the, the knowledge, the wisdom that he gathered within himself has been no, it has been documented in a series of books 
which literally form an ocean. I have tried to go through his books. Even going through one book is, requires so much effort, so much understanding that <clears throat> I have not been able to do much. It is literally an ocean. All that I have been able to do is to pick up a few drops from that ocean and mull it over in, your mind, in my mind and I'm going to give you my reactions on that. One of the things that Swami Vivekananda had said, which runs directly counter to what Jawaharlal Nehru had said is, India cannot understand anything, India cannot look at anything except through the prism of dharma. He had said, use the word dharma, not religion. I have read this in Bengali, it's Hindi also, it uses dharma. There is no synonym for dharma in English because the concept is peculiarly Indian. And there are certain things about India which before me, Srimati Carolina Goswami has explained very adroitly, which enable us to understand what dharma is. To a Westerner, it is not that apparent unless he makes an effort, he or she makes an effort. Now, is dharma religion? No, dharma is much bigger than religion. Dharma is bigger than religion. What is religion? Religion is a conception of divinity. Different religions conceive divinity in different ways. Some conceive divinity in an animate form. Some conceive it in an inanimate form. Some conceive it as a man, some as a woman, some as a child, some as a half man, half child, like we have Nrsingha avatar in the Hindu religion. It's half animal, half child. And some as a totally ethereal being without any shape, without any body, totally shapeless, totally formless, the formless God. Some conceive of it as a person, but again, in some other view of the same set of people conceive of him as the embodiment, of his embodiment in a person, and then again in the form of a trinity, three parts of the same God. So what is God? This answer is not for me to give. This answer is for religious leaders, spiritual leaders to give. But what I understand is that this is what every religion tries to tell, that what is God, what is the form of God. Religions also give a code of conduct that thou shall not eat beef or thou shall not eat uh, pork or Thou shalt not meet, eat meat on Fridays or Thursdays or during Lent. These are codes of conduct. These are ritualistic injunctions. But this is where religion stops. And dharma encompasses all these things. And on top of that, dharma has something more. This is why dharma is untranslatable into English or I suppose any Western language. Dharma is universal. Religion is person specific. A person subscribes to one religion. Every person, every right thinking person subscribes to dharma. Or at least his value system is based on dharma. How is dharma over and above religion, how is it more than religion? First of all, it has philosophy. Religions may have philosophy, may not have philosophy. But philosophy is the, I would say, the lesser part of religion. The greater part of religion are two. One is the concept of divinity, including the concept of a prophet. And the other thing is that code of conduct, which is largely a lot of rituals. As opposed to that, 
Dharma also imposes a code of conduct. But that code of conduct is essentially spiritual. That spiritual code of conduct which Dharma imposes is so different from the ritualistic code of conduct that mere religion imposes that there is a very, that creates a very substantial difference. If we study the Vedas, we find this distinction. In every Vedas, we know there are three parts, Samhita, Brahmana, and Upanishad. Samhita are psalms, a lot of songs. Brahmana are the religious, the ritualistic part of the Vedas. As opposed to that, Upanishad is philosophy. Upanishad or Vedanta is philosophy. That is why Swami Vivekananda had said that Vedanta is the religion of the future. The whole world will eventually subscribe to Vedanta. Now, I don't know, I don't know enough of other religions to know if their scriptures contain this clear distinction between different parts of dharma, but not as far as I have studied, which is of course not much. Religion also teaches us how to behave with a person of another religion. This, is, this has caused a lot of bloodshed and warfare all over the world. Dharma is, because it is universal, dharma does not teach any such thing. And it is through the prism of this dharma that Swami Vivekananda said that Indians can conceive of anything. Now, in a country like India, is it conceivable that it can move from science to, uh, away from religion into science? And is dharma opposed to science? Doesn't dharma accept that Today what is being said is not the final thing. It can be overridden by something just as Newton's corpuscular theory of light was overridden by Huygens' uh, theor wave theory of light and that was later on overridden by the photoelectric effect of Planck. Therefore, not photoelectric effect, the quantum theory of light postulated by Planck. So therefore, dharma, true dharma, which is spiritual, it recognizes that the concept of spiritualism can change from time to time. This is why Lord Krishna, when telling Arjun what is to be done, over 18 chapters of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, at the very end says, Iti te jnana makhatam gujjhat gujjhitarang maya vimrishyamete cesena jatachasi tathakuru. In other words, I have given you the greatest and the most hidden bit of wisdom that exists in this world. Now you go over this, you mull over this and then after that you do what you please which really means that he is, this is something, this is an advice which comes at the very end of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which tells us that you have to strive after truth, you have to strive after dharma all the time. And as time goes on, you go on finding newer and newer forms of, forms of dharma, but dharma remains universal. The greatest of dharmas, as I have, I have found out, and which is literally opposed to religion, is Lord Ramakrishna saying, Jato mot tato pot. This is in Bengali. There are as many ways of reaching God, that is, as many ways of reaching God as there are paths. You can take any one of these paths. He had given a parable also. He said that in, from the same pond, different people come and pick up water. Somebody calls it jol, somebody calls it pani, somebody calls it water, but they are taking the same thing. There is no difference. This was encapsulated in just four words in Bengali, jatamat tatapat. Now, this is not what religions teach. 
A lot of religions don't teach this. Therefore, we find that there is this difference between dharma as we understand and religion. So far, I was trying to say that religion, dharma is much bigger than religion, but here we find dharma is opposed to religion. This is also something to think over, something to mull over, and to, in, uh, and to try to find out greater truths. Now, we all strive to do this all the time. And it is through colloquium such as this, which Dr. Kanoria has organized, that we try to arrive at the absolute truth. We shall never, we mere mortals, we shall never be able to strive, arrive at the absolute truth. It will keep on manifesting itself to us at different points of time, at different levels. But we must understand that these are merely newer and newer forms of truth, newer and newer forms of dharma. This is why Swami Vivekananda had said that Indians can conceive of anything only through the see anything, through the prism of dharma. And it doesn't matter while I am thinking over it while I am trying to find out the truth in my own mind. It doesn't matter how many other people do it. Just to give one small example. The Ganga, which is a river, which is very sacred to us. It flows all the way from Gangotri down the plains to Bengal and finally meets the sea. Bay of Bengal at Ganga Sagar. But which stream of the Ganga meets the Ganga Sagar, uh, sea at Ganga Sagar? It is not the mainstream of Ganga. Ganga's mainstream flows into a river called Padma, which goes into Bangladesh. There is only a small spill channel called Bhagirathi in the district of Murshidabad, which carries away all the sacredness of the Ganga. From the confluence, uh, from the point where the Bhagirathi diverges away from the parent Ganga, the rest of the Ganga, the mainstream of the Ganga, which is termed Padma and later ma, ma, termed Meghna, they carry no special sacredness. Entire sacredness goes out with Bhagirathi, which flows by Calcutta and eventually empties itself into the Bay of Bengal. So it doesn't matter how many other people follow you. What matters is, are you honestly trying to strive to arrive at the truth, arrive at the true nature of dharma? And I congratulate, I thank, I bow before Dr. Kanodia for letting us do this, for taking us along the path of this exercise by organizing colloquia such as this. Thank you, sir. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We thank His Excellency, the Governor of Meghalaya, and we are going to do it formally uh, through the felicitation.